The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Beloved of Christ, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Peter writes in his first epistle, chapter 4. If the righteous is scarcely saved. You know, that's a very sobering verse for us to consider this morning, this last Sunday of the Easter season. For seven weeks now, we've, we've been rejoicing in the resurrection of our Lord, His atonement for our sin on the cross, and His great victory over death in His resurrection, as we should. Easter, is one of our, as one of our hymns put it, is the queen of seasons, the most important season in the church's year, the seasons that all the other seasons revolve around. Without Easter, we're nothing, and we have nothing. Without the resurrection of Jesus, the church is only a fantasy. And so we celebrate Easter long and loud. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And this week, in case you missed it, throughout the church, many have celebrated the ascension of our Lord, as we would call Jesus' coronation day. The fact that our brother and Savior is now sitting on the throne of David, at the Father's right hand, ruling all things for the good of his church. This is another reason to rejoice, which the disciples did after Jesus ascended. They weren't sad that Jesus had left, as we might expect. No, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They knew that this was a good thing. But they also knew the world was still a dangerous place. That there would be, as we heard from Peter today, fiery trials. The Christians would suffer for their faith, that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Usually today, when we say something like the world is a dangerous place, we think of terrorism or shootings or now COVID-19. But today, with these words, we're reminded that there is a greater threat than that. Greater both because of its consequences and because it often happens without our even knowing it. And that is the threat to our faith. Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But honestly, we're usually just the opposite, aren't we? So maybe it's not pleasant, but it's good for us to hear and consider Peter's words today as hard as they may be. If the righteous is scarcely saved, if those righteous, those made righteous by grace through faith, are scarcely saved, that is, saved with great difficulty, then we should pay attention. As we heard of the danger today, also from Peter in the first reading from Acts, as we heard about Judas, you know his story. But don't rush past it, as I think we usually do, because we're used to hearing it. Just lumping him together with other famous betrayers like Benedict Arnold, for example. But I don't think that it was like that in that upper room where those 120 Christians were together. Judas was their friend. He had been their companion for three years. They had done everything together. They relied on him and he on them. He was one of the 12 pillars, the 12 disciples, Jesus' inner circle. They were brothers. They were close. They would have taken a bullet for Judas. And then suddenly, without any warning, he turned the gun on them. And they probably wondered how. What happened? It was earth-shaking. So as they gathered in that upper room they were, and, then, and they were praying, they were also thinking, maybe even mourning. Not Jesus. They were joyful because of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. But at the same time, they were mourning the loss of their friend. This was a tragedy. Scripture had to be fulfilled, Peter said sadly. That's true. But that didn't make it any easier for them. Jesus was crucified, but he rose from the dead. Their friend, Judas, wasn't coming back. Danger all around. Threats greater than the threat to your life. If the righteous is scarcely saved, how does that happen? How does a Judas happen? Well, there's probably lots of ways, but often I think it's the devil, the world, 
and your own sinful nature, our own sinful nature, chipping away, slowly eroding your foundation. Little by little, it lures you away so that you don't even notice it. What you once thought unthinkable, now you, now you find yourself thinking about it. Places you would never go, you start to go. You're acting different. Your, your priori priorities have shifted. Why? If the righteous is scarcely saved. So Peter says, be sober-minded or clear thinking about these things. Be watchful or don't let down your guard. These are good words coming from Peter for he not only knew the sting of losing his friend Judas, maybe he was also thinking of how close he had come to being in that very same place. He was the one who had denied Jesus three times. He was the one who tried to walk on the water but sank like a rock. He was the one to whom Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. If the righteous is scarcely saved. When Peter wrote those words, I think he was talking about himself. Danger all around. We rejoice in Christ's resurrection and ascension, but the world is still a dangerous place. So what about you? Are you in less danger? Are you less susceptible to the temptations of Satan and the allures of sin? Are you stronger than Peter? And maybe think, I would never be Judas. That's pretty heavy stuff, I know, and that's not very Eastery, you say, Pastor. Give us some good news, will you? Well, Peter does, for he also writes this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Humble yourselves. That is, know yourself. Take a realistic look at yourself. How do you do that? By repenting, by, by acknowledging not just the danger, but that you've given in, that you've been taken in, that you've turned away. You too have gone your own way. You thought you were strong. You thought you could do it. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he does. Cast all your anxieties on him, Peter writes. Cast them all on him. Cast all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of that shame and failure and all that weakness on him because he cares for you. He wants it. He cares. You are not your own. The reason he came down from heaven is because he cares. The reason he went to the cross is because he cares. And the reason he is here in his word and sacrament for you is because he cares. He cares, and so he says, I forgive you for all of it. That sin that you're thinking of right now, I forgive you. That you've drifted away from me, I forgive you. You've taken me for granted, I forgive you. And that's not just words. Here I give my body and blood the, the most holy thing to make you holy, to restore you, to confirm you, to strengthen you, and establish you, to make you my own and keep you close to me. For you are my child, Jesus says. I baptized you. How could I leave you? How could I not forgive you? Hear my absolution, eat my body, and drink my blood. I forgive you, and I will tomorrow, too. Now, that doesn't mean that your sin doesn't matter. It does, of course. But it means that the love and the mercy of Jesus is greater than your sin. You see, Jesus knows how hard life is. After all, he lived it right here in this world. He lived a life as a person just like you. He lived under the assault of Satan, facing the ridicule of the world, being tempted and lured. He knows. That's why he's here for you. 
that your future may not be in Akeldama, a field of your own blood, but yours will be the pasture of your good shepherd, washed in his blood. Jesus knows how hard life is. That's why he also prays for you. We heard some of those words in our gospel for today, culminating with these words. He says, Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. You know how that happens? That you're kept as one with God? That we can be one with each other? You know. It's forgiveness. When you have forgiveness, though you may not realize it, when you have forgiveness, you have everything. Indeed, you have Christ. You are a son, a daughter of the Father, and you have the Spirit who has given you such faith to believe. And in a world where life is hard and dangerous, and if the righteous is scarcely saved, isn't that good to know? That you have Christ, you have the Father, you have the Spirit, you have someone that you can rely on who will not let you down? That confidence is what turned Peter the denier into Peter the martyr. Peter didn't suddenly become strong. Christ and his Spirit were strong in him. They're strong in, in you as well, my friend. His word, his water, his food, his forgiveness, strong in you. So knowing how great the danger, you know how great your Savior. You know how great your sin. You know how great his forgiveness. And knowing how great your weakness, you know how great his strength. And that is is our joy this Easter season. That's why we've been rejoicing loud and long. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah. Though you may suffer as a Christian, though fiery trials may test you, though sin still lurks and the devil still prowls and the world still attacks, you have a savior, a risen one, an ascended one who cares for you. and whose care for you will never end. And though humble now, he will exalt you at the proper time, raising you from the dead to live and to reign with him in all eternity. For while Matthias was chosen to take Judah's place, Jesus was chosen to take your place on the cross. And you were chosen to take his place in heaven. That, my friends, is our Easter joy. Your Easter joy. All the promises of Scripture fulfilled for you. So yes, the world is a dangerous place. And yes, the righteous is scarcely saved. But saved they are. Well, let's say it one more time this season. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.